rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall and there was no breaks left in it that Sambalat and Geshem sent to me saying come let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono look at this but they thought to do harm to me they thought to do harm to me so I sent messages to them saying I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down I want everyone to say I am doing a great work now notice here he says why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you they sent messages four times and I answered them in the same way then Sambalot sent his service to me as before the fifth time with an open letter in hand and he said it is written and reported among the nations that you and the Jews plan to rebel and according to these rumors you are rebuilding the wall that you may be their king before you're seated look at your neighbor and tell them stay on the wall you may be seated thank you as we were there worshiping I asked brother Leo I said Leo how many days have we been experiencing revival here in our church starting October 1st and he said pastor it's been 111 days 111 days heaven has been open over our lives and over our church I was watching online yesterday because I was just in the bed all day how many were blessed through that all night prayer meeting Ooh, man and the Lord is still moving and I was watching a, a conference on YouTube called Awake in 2020, and they had a minister there to share a few words. He was from San Diego. And he said that in their church, they have experienced revival for over 1,000 days. Over 1,000 days that they have been operating under an open heaven. So that's a number of years. So how many believe that it's important that as the people of God, we need to stay on the wall of prayer. We need to continue to stay on the wall. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. Stay on the wall. Pray on the wall. Come on now. Now, it says here that he was on the rampart. A rampart is a defensive wall or castle or a walled city. Having a broad top with a walkway and it's typically a stone parapet. So if you look behind me on the screen, this is the picture of a wall that they would use in the ancient cities. Now, walls played such an important role in ancient cities because they served as defensive fortifications that served against aggressors or violent attackers that would come against them. Soldiers of that city were positioned along the wall in order to alert the people to the gathering forces that were coming against the city. And what these walls did is not only alert the city to danger, but these walls also gave the city a strategic advantage against the enemy because as they stood on the wall, they fought from an elevated position. How many of you believe that prayer is fighting from an elevated position? And so we need to learn to stay on the wall. You see, when the walls of Jerusalem were broken down and destroyed, the Lord placed a burden in a man by the name of Nehemiah. How many of you read that? And even though Nehemiah, who was a servant of the king, had never been to his hometown of his city, Jerusalem, he understood that the world's perception of a city without walls was a reproach. A city without walls was a bad testimony. A city without walls wasn't a good look. How many know that the picture of a prosperous and powerful city in those days had strong walls and warriors soldiers on the wall so nehemiah understanding that the walls of jerusalem had been broken down he began to be stirred with a burden for his city he began to understand that a city without walls was open to attack and that a city without walls could not prosper i think that ministers to some of us this morning is that when there's no prayer there's no prosperity where there's no prayer, there's no protection. Where there's no prayer, we can't be able to overcome the wiles of the enemy. 
You see, we know that Jerusalem was defeated and the walls were, 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 were torn down. But we understand that Jerusalem, Jerusalem and Israel was only defeated when they defeated themselves. See, God's people can't not be defeated by the enemy. God's people cannot be defeated by a foreign enemy, but we defeat ourselves when we don't seek God. We defeat ourselves when we take away and we move away from our relationship with God. You see, the walls were broken down, but it was the city of Jerusalem that sinned against God. They, they placed their dependency on self and took their dependency off of God. They allowed the things of the world to take them off the wall. They allowed the thing, and I believe I'm speaking to you prophetically this morning. How many believe that this is a prophetic message? They begin to suffer defeat because they allowed the enemy, they allowed spiritual things, they allowed the enticements of the world to take them off the wall. The city without, a, the, the city without walls, friends, is a picture of a church or a home without prayer. A city without walls is a picture of a, of a family without prayer. A city without walls is even the picture of a church without prayer. I, I got to tell you, you know, prayerlessness doesn't just happen in the home. Prayerlessness happens in the church. We do a lot of preaching, but we don't do enough prayer. And, and I believe that as our church has been praying and as our church has been worshiping and as our church has also been fasting, how many know we're rebuilding the spiritual walls here at Victory Outreach? Come on, you can give God a big praise for that. The walls are coming up. In Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13, he says, my, my people have committed two sins. They've forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. See, many times our homes, our families, our marriages, our children, our grandchildren, our people become thirsty because they realize that the world's ways don't hold water. The world's ways don't hold water. The world's systems don't hold water. You, they might satisfy you for a little while. That job might satisfy you for a little while. That worldly relationship might satisfy you for a little while. That drug might satisfy you for a little while. But it's just a matter of time where those things that used to satisfy you, they begin to break you all the way down. And what are we doing here at Victory Outreach San Diego? We say, you know what? We're, we're, enough is enough. We're ready to tap in to the living water of prayer. We're ready to tap in to the living water of fasting. Come on, somebody. We know what the world has to offer. And it did not satisfy. But the Lord says, taste and see that the Lord is good. And that God will satisfy you all the days of your life. Amen. See, we're learning to pray. And, and what I'm saying to you here today, brothers and sisters, is this. Do all you can to stay on the wall of prayer. Do all you can to keep on praying. Start praying, keep praying, and don't stop praying. My message to you this morning is don't let anything take you off the wall. Don't, don't, don't get arrogant now. I know we're having an outpouring. I know that God's moving. I know that we're in it, but don't get arrogant now. Stay humble. Hey, come on now. Don't act arrogant. Don't, don't act like this move is going to stay here on its own. Don't act like this outpouring is going to stay here on its own. Don't act like, you know, you can just come in and get a drink and not put nothing in. Come on, somebody. I came to tell you this is a season where God wants you to stay on the wall. Don't let anything take you off the wall. Don't let anything move you out of that place of prayer. Come on, somebody. Stay in the prayer closet. Stay on the fast. Get involved in what God is doing. Look at your neighbor today. Tell them, stay on the wall. Do all you can to stay on the wall. In Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 1, the main theme of this portion of scripture that I read is that his enemies did all they could to pull him off the wall. They did all they could. They plotted against him. They strategized against him. They came with letters, decrees. They said, man, Nehemiah, you're building illegally. And I came to tell you the devil is a liar. We have the right to build. We have the right to pray. We have the right to fast. We've been getting, we may not have legal authority on earth, but we have legal authority from heaven that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. And we have the power to tear down strongholds. 
See, his enemies and your enemies, they want to take you off the wall of prayer. Your enemies want to take you off that prayer wall, take you off that fast. See, Nehemiah's enemies did all they could to, to take him off the wall. And when did the enemy show up? Right when things were getting good. <laughs> did you read the scripture with me? He says, man, right, right when we were making progress. Right when we were making progress, right when we were doing well, right when we were having a breakthrough in the building project. Isn't that just like the enemy? That's right when he shows up. Isn't it just like the devil that, that, that you know, you, you're praying and you're pressing in, that old carnal Christian starts calling you to take you? Oh, come on, somebody. Right when you, your spouse, you, you're right, right when you, you're, you determine you're going to be fasting and prayer, that all of a sudden your, your barely saved spouse starts acting up. Don't let them get you off the wall. Because your progress is going to come. Your breakthrough is going to come. Your miracle is going to come. See, the enemy came right when they were making progress. And as Nehemiah was building the wall of the city, just as he was fortifying the supports of the city, getting that wall up and moving. You see, we're building a wall of prayer and fasting. We're digging wells. We're standing our watch. We're covering our families. Someone say, this, this is an important work. We're covering our families, building our walls. So how many know we have to be alert? As you stand up on that wall, be alert, stay alert. As you're praying, be alert for those things that want to take you off the wall. Now, there are three things we can learn from Nehemiah that I'm going to let you go. Number one, Nehemiah had a divine cause. A divine cause, a heavenly cause. His burden was God-given. His burden to build the wall came from the Lord. It, it was given to him by God. And the burden, as he responded to the burden, he, it came with great favor and rapid results. As, as Nehemiah took the challenge, as Nehemiah felt God dealing with him about building the walls, and as he responded, because how many know when God speaks, you know, you've got a choice. You've got a, uh, uh, you got a choice to respond or reject. And so Nehemiah didn't reject the challenge. He, he responded to the challenge. And as he responded, it came with favor from the king. See, when you're, when you're responding to God, how many know there's going to be favor on your life? And it came with favor from the king. And he began to experience nothing short of something supernatural. Nothing short of a supernatural move of God as he responded to the burden of God in his life. I came to tell you, man, when God gives you a burden and you respond, you're going to start seeing supernatural things in your life. Something about a person, a man or a woman who's willing to say yes to God. When God is leaning on you to pray. See, prayer and fasting is also a divine cause. God will lean on you. God will begin to burden you with prayer. God will wake you up in the middle of the night. God might even put you in a life or death situation where you're forced to pray. God might even use a life and death situation where you're all of a sudden waking up and you see your life flash before you. You say, oop, I better get back to God. See, how many know that a burden to pray comes from the Lord? And I came to tell you, when you respond to a burden of prayer, you are getting involved in a divine cause. You're getting involved in a heavenly mission, a heavenly task. God will lean on you. God will work in your life. A burden to pray is a work of the spirit. How many of you have been burdened to pray? Your hunger for prayer has gone to another level. Understand me, brothers. That's a work of the spirit. That's the Holy Spirit working in your life, stirring in your life, changing your life. See, when you fast, things begin to happen. When you fast, things begin to happen. Someone said, actually, uh, Reverend Franklin Hall, who wrote the book uh, Atomic Prayer with God, he said, no great cause will ever be deserted whose champions have fasted for it. Ooh, this is heavy. No great cause will ever be deserted whose champions of that cause have fasted for it. You've heard it said in Victor Outreach, if you pray, you stay. But what's the second part? If you fast, you last. And what Reverend Hall is saying here, he's saying, listen, man, the champions of a cause who fast for it, they can't be torn away from it because they're attached to it spiritually. Come on, somebody. 
You know why? You're, when you fast for your marriage, guess what? Your marriage is going to make it. When you fast for your children, guess what? Your children are going to make it. When you fast for your business, guess what? Your business is going to make it. When you fast for your church, you better believe something is going to happen in your midst because you are a champion of prayer. You are a man or woman that's involved in prayer. And to be involved in prayer, brothers and sisters, is to be involved in a divine mission from God, a divine cause. We are standing on the wall because the Lord called us to stand on the wall. There's power in fasting. When you pray and you fast, you're involved in a divine call. And when you pray, something happens in the heavenly realms of the spirit. The spirit realm is activated and the people who pray and fast are forever linked to what they pray and fast for. Listen, I don't know how it works. All I know is it works. I don't know how prayer works, but all I know is that it works. I don't know how fasting works, but all I know is that it works. And if you need a breakthrough and you need results and you need favor, you need to go on this fast. You need to separate and consecrate so that great things can be released in your life. See, if you have a heart and prayer to fast, listen, it's coming from the spirit of God and he's stirring you to pray, He's stirring you to fast. And I want you to know when you do it, people recognize it. They recognize that when you're fasting in prayer and, and you're in prayer and you're separating, and consecrating yourself, that you're involved in a divine cause. People start seeing it. I just had a meeting this week on Monday with one of the top lawyers in all the city of San Diego. He's a famous lawyer. If I mention him, you probably know him. And he's a very famous lawyer. He has billboards all over the city. And we had a meeting with him because, you know, this revival is not just happening here. It's getting out these four walls. On Thursday, we had our pastors and leaders prayer prayer breakfast here and you know we had some heavy people here pastor miles mcpherson spoke i spoke and it was packed out in this place you know for about an hour and a half this was the safest place in all san diego because you had the chief of police and all five chiefs of police sitting right here you had the fbi here you had probation here come on somebody how many know god was moving in our city And we're making an impact, pastors from all over the city. And I was meeting with this lawyer on Monday, um, just about this event we're going to be having in May with Art Blahos. And he came in and he had all this Hans and Harry cakes. So we sat down, he comes in and goes, hello. He goes, I want to bless you with all of these Hans and Harry cakes. Now, Hans and Harry is my favorite. And he had three stack boxes. He had the Hans and Harry Danish, the long one. Then he had some other breads with the Hans and Harry fruit on it. But then he busted out with this. And I was like, I didn't even know Hans and Harry's was on that level. And he busted out with some Hans and Harry's cupcakes. And I said, devil, you a dirty, foul liar, bro. I said, devil, you try to get me off this wall, aren't you? So what happened was, as he's opening up for me and Captain, uh, Lieutenant Ernesto and our other guests, and he said, here, eat, enjoy. You know, I'd love to spend time with you. And we spent a couple hours together. He goes, I want to spend time with you. Here, go ahead and eat. I want you to have all that you can. And I said, you know what? Um, I said to him, I go, respectfully, I go, I, it's so beautiful. And Hans and Harry is my favorite. Um, in fact, my birthday cake was a Hans and Harry's birthday cake. I says, but I can't partake of your offering because I'm fasting. And the minute I said I'm fasting, he goes, oh. <laughs> he went to his desk. He got a piece of paper. He wrote three things on it, folded it in hand. He says, here, will you pray for these three things? Oh. Stay on the wall. Just keep praying. Keep fasting. The second thing we learned from Nehemiah is that he saw the deceptive plans of the enemy. When you position yourself on the rampart of prayer and you begin to fast, I came to tell you, it will open up your eyes. It'll open up your eyes. Maybe you come into this year and you're blind. You're blind spiritually, you're blind naturally. You know, we wear sunglasses, but you don't even need sunglasses, you're so blind. You can't see anything. You've been blinded by the devil. Blinded by your situation, blinded by your circumstances, man. If you ever needed your eyes open, get, on a pr- get in prayer and get in fasting. 
Because when you pray and when you fast, your eyes are open. In 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 14, one of my favorite scriptures, one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible, favorite stories, Elisha and his servant are surrounded by the opposing armies of Israel because Elisha was a man of prayer and he was on the side of one king and he was telling that king all the strategies that the other king had against him and the other king was, thought that the, that king had put a spy on him and was in his bedroom hearing his thoughts and his plans and it wasn't that, it was just that God spoke to Elijah about his enemy and he's revealing it to the good king. Come on somebody. So basically, as he was fasting and praying, seeking God, it was frustrating his enemy. And so that enemy got mad and he began to mobilize the whole army against Elisha. And that army of chariots and horses surrounded uh, Elisha and his servant. Stay with me here. And his servant got nervous. His disciple got nervous. He says, oh, God, you know, we're dead. Look at all this army. It's just me and you. And then Elisha began to pray for his servant. And the prayer was, Lord, open up his eyes. Come on, somebody. And the Bible says that when Elisha prayed for his servant's eyes to be open, his servant's eyes were open not only in the natural, but they were opened up in the spiritual. And as he looked behind him, he saw an entire army of angels with horses and swords and chariots. And it was in that moment that he realized that if God be for you, who could be against you? I came to tell you there are more for us than against us. But through prayer and fasting, God opens up your eyes to the schemes and the tactics of the devil. Let me tell you something, brother. If you're hanging out with a woman that's praying, you better be careful. Because God's going to start showing her stuff about you. And guys, if you're praying fast, you're hanging out with a girl that's messing around, she better be careful. Because prayer and fasting opens up your eyes. It reveals things. It begins to show things in the spirit realm. You see, Nehemiah saw the enemy's plans here to take him off the wall and to destroy him. He knew their plot. He knew their scheme. And he knew their desire was to stop the work. But he saw it and he told them, listen, no matter what you say, doesn't matter how many times you visit me, I'm not coming off the wall. I'm not coming down. He says, I don't want to be bothered. I don't want to be diverted. I'm not going to come out of this prayer until God speaks to me. And I ain't breaking this fast. I'm not coming off the wall. He says, I sent messengers to them telling them, you know, I'm doing a great work, so I, I can't come down. I, I can't come down because I'm doing a great work. I'm involved in a great work of prayer. I'm involved. Listen, I, I'm in a work that's going to not only change my life, but it's going to change my family. I'm in a work that's not going to change my life. It's going to change my marriage. I'm in a work that's not just going to change my life, but the sinners are going to get saved and sick people are going to get healed and my young people are going to get a breakthrough. Can I hear it? I'm involved in a major work now. You may not see it as important, but in the heavenlies, God says, keep on praying, keep on fasting, keep on doing spiritual work. Don't come off the wall no matter what the devil throws your way because you're doing an important work. Tell your neighbor, I need you. Tell them I need you. I, I make a declaration today that nothing's going to take you off this wall of prayer. I speak it. I speak it. Fleshly woman, I speak it. Your husband ain't coming down. Fleshly man, I speak it. Your spouse ain't coming down. In fact, what you should do is get up on the wall with them because two are better than one. I came to tell you, you're not coming off this wall because the third thing and the final thing is that Nehemiah saw great progress through his work. Stay on the wall. Pray on the wall because it's going to bring great progress, great prosperity. You're building something in the spirit realm. You're, you're building something powerful in the spirit realm. You're building a fortress of prayer. You're building a castle of prayer. You're building a battlefield of prayer. You're building. You're building something. You're progressing. You stay on the wall because great things are going to happen. People who pray and fast see great progress in their life. 
And just as Nehemiah, look at, you know, I, I read the end of Nehemiah and it's pretty heavy that his, he, his work was so important to him that it, it made him bold, it made him radical. It made him a heavy dude. You know, in the end of the story, you know, when you put in work, how I many you become serious? So he gets all the walls up and then now he has to deal with the people. Now, he wasn't the one that to deal with people, but now he comes in, the walls are built, people are coming back, and he starts to see that all these people from Israel have mixed babies. And all the leaders had married Moabite women, women and Ammonite women and ungodly women. And he tells this one priest, he tells him, you, you know what, man, don't, you know, I'm going to tell you something, man. You married a heathen woman, and look at your kids, and the Bible says he pulled his hair. How many know that's radical? But how many know you can only get that radical when you're bold in the spirit? And he says, I don't want you with that woman, and I don't want your kids with no more mixed women. You're going to be, we're going to preserve this legacy. We're going to build up this nation. Come on, somebody. We put in too much work. We put in too much prayer. We put, in, you know what Nehemiah had? He had spiritual authority. And I declare to you that as you pray and as you, as you stand on the wall, the Lord is taking you to another level in your spiritual authority. You are a champion of prayer. You are a giant killer. You are a mountain mover. You are a miracle worker. The spirit of the Lord is upon you because he has anointed you and he has empowered you. Did you receive this word this morning? Say it real loud. Say, stay on the wall. Stay on the wall. Say, stay on the wall. Stay on the wall. Don't let anything take you off this wall. And understand, brothers and sisters, that in times of revival and outpouring, just like this, it's a matter of life and death. It's a matter of life and death. As I mentioned earlier, that Legacies are built or broken during times of refreshing. It's during times of refreshing, special seasons like this, where legacies are built or broken disastrously. There's this famous Broadway show that we all know called Hamilton. Who's heard, heard of Hamilton? Raise your hand if you've heard of it. So I don't have to explain it to you. Let me see, you heard of Hamilton? a lot of you. It's based on one of the founding fathers of our country by the name of Alexander Hamilton. My daughter loves it. And I've seen it, and it's pretty heavy. But the villain of the story is a man by the name of Aaron Burr. Aaron Burr shot and killed Alexander Hamilton in a gun duel over a disagreement that they had that Burr felt he was being slandered by Alexander Hamilton. I tell the story of my wife, she goes, where were the police? I go, they have no cops back then. <laughs> That's how they handled business. Now hold on here, it's gonna make sense. So Aaron Burr became the most reviled and hated person in US history for shooting and killing Alexander Hamilton. But if you take a closer look at Aaron Burr's life, you will find that Aaron Burr's mother was the daughter of the great revivalist, Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards preached a sermon called Sinner in the Hand of an Angry God. And, and the history says that when he preached that message, that the room began to smell like sulfur. That the message was so strong that men were banging their heads against the wall, tearing their clothes because of they were so far from God, so much in sin. That when Jonathan Edwards preached the message, sinner in the hand of an angry God, they began to mourn and weep and many people got saved. It started the first great awakening of revival in America. Come on, give God a praise. Powerful. So Aaron Burr's mother was known as one of the most godly women of her time. She was a woman of prayer. She was a minister of the gospel. She raised her children to be godly. If you study Jonathan Edwards' history, he, 
it's heavy, and I won't get into it, but it's very heavy how many successful people he produced through his bloodline. But his daughter was a woman of God. She raised her son Aaron Byrne to be a servant of God, and he, wrote, he grew up and he went to Princeton University. When he went to Princeton University, history says that there was a revival of the spirit being released at Princeton. Revival broke out on that college campus. Revival broke out. People were getting saved. They document it as an actual revival. But you know what history says? Aaron Burr, the grandson of Jonathan Edwards, the son of the most godly woman in that city, who went to Princeton in the midst of revival, was interviewed by someone and says, what do you think of this revival? And he says, you know, I respect my mother's religion, but it's not for me. He began to read the books of European philosophers, Roman history. He pulled away from what God was doing in the spirit of that moment and became one of the most hated men in U.S. history. I came to tell you, it's during times like this where destinies are built or destinies are broken. My question is this, what side of history are you gonna be on in your family tree? What side of history are you gonna be on? Are you gonna be on the side where, where it says, because he stood on the wall, because they prayed, they brought success to the family? Or are you gonna be on the side of the family tree that says, because they couldn't stop doing drugs? Because they rejected the spirit of God when he was moving the strong, because they got into money. And they thought that money was gonna bring success. But then the divorce came. Then the problems came. I don't know about you, brothers. But my message today, I think this is a good one. Stay on the wall. I want you to stand with me right now. Stay on the wall.